and the Niger Television Authority with the support of the MacArthur Foundation. These town halls represent an opportunity for you to get to know the candidates who want your votes so they can lead Nigeria for the next four years. We are live on the network service of the Nigeria Television Authority, on Television Continental TVC, and on Wazobia Television, Oak TV, and Impact Africa Television. You can also hear this program on all Radio Nigeria stations across the country, and we are streaming live online at dtv.media and nta.ng live. Today, we are in conversation with the candidates of the Africa Action Congress. Mr. Omoyele Showare and Dr. Ahmed Rufai. Mr. Omoyele Showare rose to fame as a student activist at the University of Lagos. He spent six years instead of four before graduating, mainly due to his human rights campaign against military junters. He was the president of the Student Union of the University between 1992 and 1994. He has a master's degree in public administration from Columbia University in the U.S. And in 2006, he formed Sahara Reporters through a grant from the Ford Foundation. He has subsequently received grants for his work from the Omdia Foundation. Sahara Reporters enjoys massive following through its no-hold-barred, greedy, albeit activist type of journalism. In February 2018, Mr. Shoure announced that he was running for the presidency in the 2019 election. In order to achieve this aim, he founded the Africa Action Congress. The slogan for his political campaign is, Take It Back. His running mate is Dr. Rabi Urufai, a medical doctor born in 1976. He is from Jigawa State. He's a public health expert a fellow of the West African College of Physicians and also a fellow of the Royal Society for Public Health. He's a member and associate fellow of the West African Postgraduate Medical School, a member and associate fellow of the National Postgraduate Medical College of Nigeria, and a member of the Medical and Dental Council of Nigeria. He was also a former registrar at the Aminu Kano Teaching Hospital. Welcome to the candidates, Mr. Shore and Dr. Thank Rufai. you very much. Thank you for bringing Thank us. You. With us tonight are also members of the Diplomatic Corps, Civil Society, political um, analysts, citizens who have questions for our candidates. I too will have some questions, but as important are also the questions that are coming from those of you watching us at home. So, if you want to participate, here is how to do it. Send your questions on any of the social media handles on Twitter, at the Daria Media, or at NTA News Now, on Facebook, at the Daria Media, on Instagram, at Daria Media NG. Throughout the program, these handles will scroll on your screen. Don't forget to use the hashtag NG the candidates. Otherwise, your questions may get lost. Again, remember to tell your friends and family in the diaspora that they can watch this program online. We are streaming live on dtv.media and nta.ng. Now, let us turn to the candidates. Um, first questions to both of you, and you can answer in whatever order you choose to. Why should Nigerians vote for you as president and vice president? February. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Nigerians and those in the audience tonight. Nigeria has been around for 58 years, led by men with little or no ideas on how to move a nation from any destination uh, to the other. 
And as a result, what you have as a nation today, what was started as a nation has become a business. Nigeria is not working for the people of Nigeria, it's working only for a few people that continue to enjoy at the expense of a majority. And as a young person, in 1989, Nigeria's biggest problem was taking power from a bunch of military men and giving it to a majority through a democratic process. That was why I was expelled twice from the university and ended up I spent six years instead of four years. I was attacked, I was jailed, I was beaten, I was tortured. But luckily in 1989, sorry, 1999, we had democratic rule. But what could have been democratic rule, with due respect, became a morontocratic rule, where morons ride roughshod on the Nigerian people. We are young people who have been exposed, who have intellects, who have capacity, and who have seen the rest of the world. We've seen the best of two worlds, Nigeria and elsewhere. And we've also seen the best of even the worst of the two worlds. Today, we are here with fresh ideas. We are here with innovative ideas. We are here able to mobilize Nigerian people. We are here to mend a country that has been broken by misgovernance and wickedness and corruption. And we are also here with solutions that match the aspirations of our people. And we are also here, ready to confront with courage the leadership that mismanaged our opportunities and have destroyed our past and are now trying to hijack and kidnap our future. We are also here, able to speak on behalf of those who have been destroyed, whose opportunities have been, of course, mismanaged over all these years by these leaders. They are here crying for help and we're here leading the charge on their behalf. And we believe, and we understand, and we know that given the opportunity, we can put the miseries of the past in the past and yeah. march towards a better future for this country. And we have done it before. Okay, let me, let me, let me just stop you there. Yes. I, I mean, you, I'm sure know yes. that there are like 98 different political parties. That's understandable. And we have, I think, up to eight or nine presidential candidates, each one of them more or less tells the same story when you ask them why they want to become president and why Nigerians you like them. They tell you about all the problems that Nigeria have. I'm trying to get a sense from you of why you are uniquely qualified I, and not the other seven I am that not, are contesting against you. I'm not here you. speaking on behalf of the other seven. I'm aware there are over 70 something presidential candidates, as a matter of fact, but not all of them are stepping forward for reasons best known to them. But I'm telling you that I'm unique on the side of history. I'm unique on the side of pedigree. I'm unique on the side of character. I'm, I'm unique on the side of integrity. I have been part of every political solution preferred independently to make Nigeria a better country for the last 30 years. Nigeria has only been around for 58 years. I started in 1989. In 2019, I have been engaged fighting to expand our democratic space. I have been fighting against corruption so that we can end poverty. I am fighting against ignorance so that we can give our children education. I am fighting against men and women in this country who are stealing so that it can be enough for people who are hungry to eat. I am telling you that I have history. I'm unique in that way. There's no candidate, even some of the older candidates, some of them who call themselves retired army generals, retired custom officers, who can say that they have independently served this country the way I have in the last 30 years. And that is why I'm unique, and this is the reason why I can stand in front of anybody and say that I'm, I will be, this country will be better off in our hands instead of the hands of the Bucaneers that put the country in the condition that it is today. Okay, so um, your activism um, from your student days to date, as far as you're concerned, is your unique selling point. Before we sort of focus and have a conversation about that work yeah. that you've done, what qualifies your running mate to become the vice president of Nigeria? Because oh, you I mean, okay, rubbish, I'm the I'm the Could you speak brothers up? Brothers and sisters, comrades, friends, wherever you are, very good evening to you. Good evening for hosting us. You asked a very important question, but when you read my CV, I couldn't even recognize myself. Uh, I'm here not a spare part or a spare tire to the, you know, party, African Action Congress, uh, 
Chore has actually done well in moving the Take It Back movement, which transformed to a political party. We are now contesting for this uh, post. You realize that uh, there is no better story to tell than to tell our own stories for Nigerians to vote for us, which is the real story. We represent the largest constituency in this country. This is the seventh geopolitical zone, you could call it, but it's a social, actually, So you're cycle. talking about age here? In terms it's of not about age. age. It's okay. what the Nigerians, you know, are suffering from for all these years. We are a generation that our leaders have let down seriously. No opportunities for school, for hospitals, for roads and other infrastructure. And you realize, actually, when you want to study uh, or you want to help slaves, you don't ask the slave masters or the slave ship captain. You ask the slaves themselves. And that's why we are here to salvage Nigeria and our teeming population that are yearning for good governance and good leadership in this country. You know, you have seen it all over. You understand? Our party came with the best of the manifestos. That is the spice I hear. Because at the moment, you realize that Nigeria is testless. If it is full, you can't take it. Because there's nothing there, actually, for us to be proud of, having been let down. Yeah, you you talked about your manifesto, and, I, and I will, you know, we'll get a chance to sort of go Absolutely through the details of what you're trying to do. But I, I want to come back to Mr. Showere and specifically um, focus on the activism. The activism, um, we know you were in university, spent six years, fought a military junta. There seems to be a little bit of a gap in terms of your public history. And so I'd like to be able to fill that gap for Nigerians. You were at university, you graduated. Not much is known between that period of graduation and you setting up Sahara Reporters. What did you do? So I entered university in 1989. I graduated around 1995, eventually, after I was brutally attacked at the University of Lagos and injected with an unknown chemical substance. I then was delayed after I graduated, they seized my result for months. And I was mobilized to go to NYC, and I did my NYC in Yola, Adamawa State, between 1995 and 1996. And after that, I was arrested and detained by the military junta under Abacha after, on the day of my passing out parade. And I spent a week. Until a newspaper reporter at the Punch, not an edition, I think Stanley Yakubu wrote his story and I was released. Because they put me in a guard room in, an, in a Nigerian Air Force detention center, chained to the ground. And then after that, I left Yola, went back to my activism. Uh, by 1998, I led one of the most popular struggles after I left university called, you know, disrupting the Noga Games on behalf of students who were expelled by the military at that time. And after that, I became a little sick and traveled to the U.S. Uh, in 1999, before the elections happened in 1999. And I've been in the U.S. since 1999, and now it will be 20 years since then that uh, I've been away. So there, 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 I mean, people talk about you coming, um, you know, from a sort of, I've heard talk about you being a poor fisherman boy, and now there is some, um, allegations or there are talks that you're worth something like $10 million. Your net worth is $10 million. And I'm trying to close that gap to try and understand how do you go from sort of being locked up, running into exile, and sort of 10 years later you founded a media website and you're worth $10 million. Because, you know, Nigerians have issues with leaders who talk about integrity, but don't have it. And so it's, it's good to establish these things. Well, thank you. It's true that uh, I grew up poor. I, I was fishing for my entire family at nine years old. As of today, I don't have a dime in my account, <laughs> uh, except contributions from people who are supporting this campaign, 
because I had to leave Sahara Reporters and I cannot be paying myself while I'm doing this. So I don't have that worth. But Sahara Reporters is probably worth more. Let me say this to you no, when reason, you are innovating. Let me, let me explain why yeah. that is important because yeah. as I understand it, you hold an American passport. I don't hold an American passport. Okay. No. I have never changed my citizenship since I left this country. Okay, so the, the, I have the a concerns... Nigerian passport and I have a green card, right. which is a permanent residency of the U.S. I never changed my part, nationality. Part of the concern that has been expressed to me in sort of researching um, this particular program mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. the idea that there might be some sort of foreign influence behind you because of your ability to raise money for Sahara from foundations and all of that. No. Uh, when we walked in here, you introduced yourself. You said this is funded by the Kato Foundation. You know, so I have also been funded. Sahara Report has also been funded by the Makato Foundation before. It doesn't mean that someone has a foreign influence. You know, people who have foreign influence. There are people who have to pay 1.1 million naira to get a U.S. visa just to visit for two days. Those are people with foreign influence. You know, people with foreign influence. People who are helping Morocco to join the West Africa ECOWAS simply because. They want to get money on the side to run for election. Those are people with foreign influence, not sure. I have absolutely no foreign influence. If there's any influence on me, it's the conscience of the suffering people of this country. Mm -hmm. And that's the influence that will drive us to victory. Okay. Now, <laughs> this, this question is for both of you. And even though he's known as the activist from your initial answer, yeah. I got the sense that you are also quite driven. Ah. Um, part of um, the criticism I've heard against you is that you thrive on sensationalism and uh, controversy. And the concern is that Nigeria is actually really right, very fragile right now. Mm. And whoever becomes president needs to have the qualities of a bridge builder. Oh. People don't see that in you and maybe to a lesser extent also <laughs> in you. What would you say about that issue of needing someone who will heal and who will kai 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 in this race who have been to thirty three states across Nigeria in the last nine months. We've been to places as remote as Kebi, Zamfara, I've been to Shok I have been to uh, River State, I've been to Bayesa State, we've been in states like Akwaibom, we've been in some states that most Nigerians have never been to before and we've been received. We were in Taraba last week, we were in uh, Adamawa last week, and in all of these places we get acceptance, we get great reception and people are saying, look, this is our brother. We are the greatest build bridges, um, sorry, build bridges, uh, uh, bridge builders you can find in this country today. I have never met uh, Dr. Rufai before, but when we met it as if we were brothers, and we were wondering, what is it that has been dividing this country for so long? If people can get together, 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 get together,
solar farms that will generate 4,500 megawatts of power. We are going to do 90 uh, uh, kilowatts per university, right? And we are going to do solar farms across the country for 500 megawatts each. It takes less than, you listen to, please, if you listen to me, I'll deliver this to you so that Nigerians can hear it. It takes less than a year. It took Egypt less than two and a half years to do 14,000 megawatts at 500 thousand naira per megawatts of 
power. It's the cheapest in the world. Here we can even do it cheaper because we have plenty of cheap labor to do it. I'm not saying we are going to abuse, abuse labor here. And it's the same Siemens who came to Nigeria trying to do the same thing. And people were asking them for bribes that went to Rascom, a state-owned power, power, generate, I mean, power company in Egypt to deliver the same. This is public information. You need leadership here. We don't have it. I'm trying, trying. That's the problem. From, from you need innovation. Energy-driven country, they almost went flat because of what happened. What happened? They invited a German and British company to go, and they fixed it within one year. So it's doable. Nigeria can generate 12,000 megawatts in a year if the right incentive is given, the right sense, actually, and the courage and the sincerity from the side of government. And I don't like this pessimism that we really have to get stuck in this conundrum for any longer. Believe you me, when Siemens came to Nigeria wanting to sign PPP, that's public-private partnership to create the solar, Nigeria turned them down because of graft. People were asking for bribe, and that's the norm in this country. They had to go to Egypt, and then they got 14.5,000 mega, mega, uh, megawatt in a matter of two years, and at a cost of 7.5 billion US dollars only. So at least when is not uh, really serious, but we are a serious party, we are courageous, we are determined actually to change the status quo. Now, you realize that economy is not leaves from tree that we could pluck, we really do, to, to do the work, we are going to leverage on the modern day thing, which is ICT, to improve our economic output and production. Mm -hmm. You realize that California now is one of the richest part of America and richest part of the world because of the IT giants that are there, Google, eBay. Amazon and so on. Nigeria also has to catch up with these, actually, because gone are the days. And that's why our party came up with this vision for Nigeria that really be internet oriented. And sometimes they call this chap homo internecticus, that he's no longer a homo sapien. Because we are really interested to bring apps, to bring coders into Nigeria, okay. to develop our people. In healthcare, it's now the in thing. People create. Mm -hmm. Uh, clinical decision support system apps that help our diagnosis to go better. Okay, let me let me let me go straight into your manifesto because yep. I think you know the details that I'm looking for I can find in there, and then maybe yes. we can have that conversation. You said you need an annual budget of about 500 billion dollars, mm -hmm. based on your manifesto, yep. to actualize your plans, mm -hmm. which include recruitment of teachers, yep. health workers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is uh, as opposed to the current Nigerian budget, which is between 35 to $40 billion. Um, and I'm just trying to understand how your economic plan is planning to increase this budget tenfold, almost over just a four-year period. What are the funding sources, for example, outside um, PPP and all of that? What exactly? How are you going to find $500 billion Thank in you. a country that we know is suffering from uh, uh, a lack of, if you like, productivity. No. So just so that we correct it, we have On a w number of projects that we would implement over four years. And we're looking at how much it will cost. OK, Within so it's not a period, budget. It's this not is a budget. The cost is, of there are no budget, budget of Nigeria is around. It's been consistently about $35 billion yeah. uh, per year. Nigeria's GDP is around $500 billion naira per year. So what we are saying is that there are a lot of opportunities for us to increase our revenue. And we'll do so by, you know, of course, ensuring that all the leakages that are there with corruption and waste and mismanagement, we get rid of that. That can save us $5 billion. Just let me finish there. And when we go next from there is how we can actually increase the collection of our taxes the collection rate of our taxes is the lowest even in the African sub-region. And right now we're at about 7%. Ghana, our neighbor here is about 15%. What it means is that we can increase from what it is now, which is about 6 trillion naira, to about you know, uh, 10 to 15 trillion naira when we are effectively collecting taxes. We are not increasing taxes. We are just collecting company income taxes, we are ensuring that all of the tax categories are adequately and efficiently collected. Okay, so and, how, how and will you give tax breaks to stimulate growth for small and medium businesses if what you're talking about is increased taxation? I mean, 
increasingly, and you are seeing. Let me finish. Taxes. Let me finish. We're you, you, collection rate of taxes. We are, when we talk yes. to a lot of the people who support you, yes. they see you as the candidate of the common man. Yes. of the citizen That's who's right. been disadvantaged over the years. That's right. And yet here you are talking about increasing taxes. No, that's not correct. Yes. No. I did not say we'll increase okay, taxes. Okay, I mean I misspoke. Yes. Not increase, collecting more taxes. No, well, yes, yes. Collecting, collecting more, more taxes, taxes from people who otherwise let me explain to you very quickly what I mean by that. Okay. There are a lot of companies out there today who are deducting taxes from their workers and pocketing it without paying to the federal government. Mm -hmm. That is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. yeah. As a reporter, I did an investigation recently mm -hmm. and found out that most of the companies that are in Nigeria, including the big companies, breweries in particular, some of them are supposed to be paying five billion in company income taxes. They are only paying 800 million because they have friends in those sectors that can help them hide the books. Why do you think Lagos is doing well? It's because they decided that it is time to be collecting taxes. What they do with the taxes and who it goes to, you know, as per the party big, big men, is a different issue. But at least they are collecting the taxes. And if they were to be spending their taxes on the citizens, Lagos would probably be El Dorado by now. So, That's so, what so it looks like so you're no borrowing in taxes. some of your plans yes. seem to be very similar to what the APC is currently no, no, doing. I, no, They've I, increased tax collection. No, I, I rebooked that. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Tunde Fowler, for example, yes. the man in charge of the Federal Inland Revenue, yes. has spent the last two, three years doing exactly what you've said should be done, which is getting people who normally don't pay taxes to pay, mm. persuading those that have taken wealth abroad to start paying taxes on their um, assets, mm. et cetera, et cetera. And so, again, the, the issue is trying to get clarity mm. regarding why your drive is different from what they are currently doing, which has actually seen an increase in, in, in collection of uh -huh. taxes. And Lagos, that you give an example of, obviously is an APC state, and everybody's taking a cue from them when it comes to taxes. Well, that's, that's exactly what I'm saying here, is that our own plan is different from theirs, because their own plan is tax collection that is funding special interests. Our own is tax collection that is funding the people. That's exactly the difference. You know. So I don't want to mention Tunde Fowler's name. I don't know him well enough to know how much taxes he's collecting. But if the APC is a party that we know very well, they are probably not collecting taxes from people who are in the APC. They are going after people who are owing taxes who are in other political okay. parties. That is the trait of the APC. That's why you know, I said you I know this is not a the debate. Comparison. They're not here to defend themselves. Yes. So let's focus on your Well, they, they, they are watching us, trust me. And their ministers were here with you last week. So uh, we watched them last week. We hope they are watching us this time around. Let me quickly ask too. Dr. Mm. Rufai a, government, a question that has come from someone and it's related to what we're talking about. Mm. Amamata Suleiman mm. writes and yeah. says, how do you plan to sustain the salary package of 100,000 of minimum wage mm. that you have promised? Yes. Amamata Suleiman. Maybe Dr. Rufai oh, can answer that question. Um, I, I like the question, and this is not going to be anything near or close to what APC, you know, does or is doing. Yesterday they passed uh, through the Council of State 30,000 minimum wage. 27, what 000. we have, 27,000, what we have is actually not uh, a minimum wage, but a living wage. That's why we put it to 100,000. And you realize, if you can help me do the math, an average worker is likely to spend at least a thousand naira for feeding mm. on a daily basis. Mm. And then to transport himself to work, and then to have some savings for healthcare, and then utility bill. Now food, if it's a thousand, and then so you multiply it by 30 days. So by your calculation, this is what is required, is what by, you're saying. Yeah, yeah. By your calculation, and, this is what a worker and, requires. And that's what we aim to achieve, actually, right. because it has a, uh, a kind of uh, positive feedback mechanism multiplier effect. Mm -hmm. When you improve the w wages, that in itself can control some level of corruption because you now disincentivize people to be tempted to, corrupt them, to be corrupted by people or vested interests. 
At the same time, this is the money they can actually use in sending their kids to school so that we can have a better Nigeria. These are the monies they can use to what, access health care services, health as well. The healthier they are, the better they will be productive economically. And if you now put this together, you realize it is really important that we keenly look at these other countries that we are almost at the same level with the middle income or lower income countries actually are giving their workers higher wages than Nigeria. South Africa, for instance, is 136,000 naira compared to Nigeria. So even the 30, uh, 100,000, we said, is for the beginning of our what, term. Okay, let, the me, time let, we me, get let me ask you if you've done the math in terms yep. of how much of an increase that is. Absolutely. It's a percentage increase of 456, mm -hmm. which means you're going to see uh, the federal government wage bill mm -hmm. basically increase by almost two trillion mm -hmm. a year. Mm -hmm. um, and that means we're looking at an increase that will take the yearly wage bill to about 9.1 trillion. That is the math. Mm -hmm. no. If we go with what you're what you're that's saying, that, based on what the federal government pays that's, currently. That's, that's actually not correct. It is correct. Okay. Please do the numbers. Yeah. Well, we've done our math, that's what I'm saying. Yes. yes. That is correct. Yes. Well, from from, from, from 18,000 to 100,000 mm -hmm. is an increase that will mean you will be paying an extra 7 trillion annually. Well, that's... On, let, let, I, on I, wages. Wanted to, I wanted to jump into that so that uh, we can get this accurately to Nigerian people, right? Uh, there are about 890,000 federal workers. Mm. That number, due to corruption, is bloated to about 1.5 million workers at the federal level. We are going to leverage on technology to get rid of the 500,000 ghost workers. I'm telling you that. That's the truth. Okay. And what it means is that when you are coming to work, it's it, either your fingerprint you, or your you retina a, scan no, when you throw that admits you into like the that, office. Mr. Showere, yes. when you throw a figure out like that, yes. you need to be able to tell Nigerians how you arrived at the fact that you're sure Nigeria we, has 500,000 ghost workers. Yes, no, no. We have been talking to, we have been talking to labor unions who know of this scam. Even the Nigerian police, I think last year, found about 80,000 people who are ghost workers in their system. The former minister of finance found that there are 10,000 workers on the payroll of the federal government in the railway sector. No, I'm not arguing no, that I'm, we have, we going, have we ghost are, workers. Are, I'm doing, not arguing. We are doing mathematics Dif now. No, different, which not, different, yeah. different, different governments. But I want, but I want no, to... No, hang on, hang on. Different yes. governments yes. at different times. Yes have come in and have sort of exposed the fact that they found ghost workers, including the current government and the one before it. Yeah. What I'm asking is that you seem very clear and very emphatic yes. about the numbers. Yes. You said you believe there are 500,000 ghost workers on Almost. the federal payroll. Wage yes, bill, yes, payroll. And yes. I'm asking, yes. what is the basis for arriving at this number? It's complete, that's what I'm just telling you that we've been investigating. I will be giving you direct information that are even coming from government officials themselves. But to how much it will cost, you know, because the increase that will happen is going to be for about 70% of the federal workers on, on federal payroll, you know, minus the ghost workers, okay, which that's the first thing we do. We are going to push them with technology. So if you don't have your fingerprint recognition, you can't get into a federal office under our government. If you cannot do retina scan, you can't get into office. And when you are leaving, we'll be able to tell if you came to work and when you left work, because your eyes will reveal that or your finger will reveal that. It's already happening here. There's no reason why we are not doing what other smaller countries are doing. But coming to the cost now, we are looking at about 1.5 trillion naira. That's what is going to be added to the federal uh, wage bill. So these are your numbers? Okay. Yes. These we are have a 7 no, million, but you're saying it's, it's based seven on the trillion, workers. Yes. Okay. That's because we are, we are dealing first and foremost with federal workers. And what we have discovered is that if Nigeria is losing, that's, that's the most equivalent of about one point something billion dollars. Oh. If Nigeria is losing so much money, right, to corruption and we plug it, you know, we get rid of ghost workers, there will be enough money to pay workers at 100,000 naira, you know, per head. But let me tell you something about even the current increase that they've just done 
uh, yesterday, that which is 30,000 naira. Do you know how much the federal government said they are adding to the federal wage bill? About 24 billion. That is the cost, according to their own records from the budget office, in which I read a few days ago. So it's not a lot of money. 24 billion naira is less than what the APC will use for their rallies in a few okay. states. Let me, but let we me, don't want to pay workers because we don't care about, about workers. Okay, you know, this is federal. Yes. So the chances are, if that happens at the federal yeah. level, um, we've, we know from experience that before you know it, the workers in the states yes. also start to agitate, agitate for yes. an increase. Yes. And some states are not even economically viable. And so what is your um, view and what are you going to do regarding the states? Have you thought about that? So whatever it is we increase at the federal level in terms of improvement in taxes, revenue collection, stopping wastage, corruption, and mismanagement, is going to go into a pool, a federal pool that will be shared to the state. So the higher, the more money we make at the federal level, the more money the states get. The reason why states are not paying workers is not because they don't have money, in most cases, is because we have irresponsible state governors. And I hope the states I, I, will vote I, I, them I, I, out in this election. Absolutely. Even Should, President Buhari Joey, said it, I, that I'm they gave Paris Club. And, and, and I'm, I'm again oh. listening to you oh. And again, you're sounding like other governments that have been here. No, no. Nothing. No, let me no, finish. No, no. Let me finish. This issue it of... It sounds like you don't no, want to no, give me no, no, the no. opportunity... Let me ask the question, then you will answer. Yes. Let me ask Empirically, the question. No, no. how I we're solving this problem. I will ask the question, yes. and then yes. you can answer. Yes. I say this because here we are with someone who's talked about restructuring. Yes. And then we're talking about taking money from the center and sharing to states again. At a time when Nigerians are saying we need to look at how to make states viable yeah. so that they can stand on their own. Yeah. But your solution in terms of wages for workers is that the center will save money and distribute it. It sounds very familiar. It is not familiar because even when you restructure Nigeria, you are not going to leave the states at the behest of the you know, restructuring without catering for them. They're still a lot of constitutional provisions that have to be made on how states can stand on their own. Look, people who are shouting restructuring okay. are not taking into consideration some of these things. And that's where we are different. That's why we are not just jumping into the restructuring argument. Yeah. And the people who are talking about restructuring are not interested in restructuring. They have a party candidate and a party they want to support to come back to power. That is what restructuring means. And now that they have found their candidate, are you hearing about restructuring anymore? But here is what I want to tell you about how we need to make states to be productive. There's a state called Kebi State, right? And they are growing rice. They said, and I cannot confirm this, so that when you are fact-checking me, that they made 150 billion naira. There is no state in Nigeria that can make up to 4 billion naira from the federal level, even on a monthly basis. But the truth is that a state that became creative and innovative growing rice is making enough money to take care of its people. You know, under and, a program pushed by the government, by the federal you want, government. To, re so you when, want to replace. That's, that's yes. what you're saying. When you're saying that... So they're doing well. Are you no, giving them they're a doing well. They're doing well because there's a government at the center that cares, but the state is also using the, its own innovation to make its own money. We've mentioned Lagos before, even though they are doing wuru-wuru with whatever they are Did making. Did I just but, hear you endorse an APC government? No, 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 no. We are, there's no APC government yeah. anywhere. We are talking about things that are working with we, Nigerian people's money. The, cent the money at the central bank is not APC's money. It's the pe money of the Nigerian people. So if we are using it and directing it to... So the farmers in Kirby states, they don't carry APC and party cards. They are innovative, hard-working Nigerians who have always been rice farmers, who have been abandoned, but when they got the necessary boost, they are working to do what they need to do. So don't make it sound like it's an APC idea. We are talking but it about is. how it is not. If, in fact, if you look at the APC manifesto, you can't find, you can't find growing of rice there. The, it's true. And, and There's the, nothing and, and in their manifesto the, that says we grow rice. The, they the, are just doing trial and error. Anything the, the, that works, it the, says they are, the anything the that doesn't work, they attribute the, it to the, someone else. Okay, all right. Yeah. We, yes. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to take a quick break, yes. and but, we can carry on when we come back. Okay. Don't go away. You forgot.
presidential and vice presidential candidates of the AAC, Mr. Shoei and Dr. Rufai. Yep. Um, I'd like to get uh, members and of the audience you... engaged and ask a few questions. So yeah, the lady yeah. in front here, we'll take maybe four and then come back to the candidates. Lady in front here, the gentleman in glasses, uh, the one right at the back in the cap, and then the gentleman in the suit right here. So yeah. let's do the four and then come back to the, um, okay. to the panel. Yes. Good evening, Nigerians and the, the AAC presidential candidates and his wife. Okay. My name is Princess Hali Majubri. I am an integrated marketing communication professional and good governance, women and youth advocacy. Mm -hmm. My question is still on power. And I have every reason to take you back. And I'd like to remind you that power is on the exclusive list of the federal government. And that you should know that the privatization that was done was based on that premise. And uh, power drives industrialization. It drives security. It drives youth employment and underemployment, women's health, child mortality and the general health well-being of citizens of this country. And it also drives tax collection because the cost of running business in Nigeria is higher than anywhere in the African sub-region. And then I put it to you that you have not accurately explained to Nigerians how you are going to tackle power that is on the exclusive list of the federal government because you haven't said that you are going to remove it okay, from there. Thank you. The gen next question, please. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Um, good evening, distinguished Nigerians, candidates of uh, the candidates on the podium. Mm -hmm. You will agree with me. My name is Shegun Awosanya, a random, ordinary citizen of Nigeria. You will agree with me that a few misconstrued social constructs must be redefined historically, holistically, in our policy for Nigeria to thrive. Mm -hmm. Namely, education as against indoctrination, erudition as against loquaciousness, leadership as against showmanship, mm -hmm. and finally, success as against self-genocidal toil for unsustainable quick wins or gains. Mm -hmm. Let me put this to you. How critical will strategic alliances and uns unsustainable social reengineering be to your administration if considered at all? Okay, thank you very much. The gentleman here, yes. I hope you're taking notes of all the Yes. Uh, good evening. My name is Ike Deze Ike. I'm a project manager and IT consultant. Um, my question borders on human capacity development. I want to ask, AAC, what plan do they have for young Nigerians. Uh, today, the United States is doing well because they invested so much in their human capacity development. Uh, we see little or nothing from governments, from the previous government, current government, in developing people, developing the youth, developing the, the minds in Nigeria. So what do AAC, what are they bringing to Nigerians Thank you. in relation to government-aided skill centers Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The last gentleman, then we'll come back to you. Uh, good evening, Mr. Shore. You mentioned something about the current government. What, what is your name, sir? My name is Olapade Akim, an economist. You mentioned something about the current government by growing rice, 
And I want you to know that currently in Nigeria, yeah, it's not only KB state that grow rice, but in, of course, and some states in the southwest and the rest. And just because the government said we are running mono economy, which is oil, we need to diversify. From diversification, we got to see the boosts into rice. What else being produced in Nigeria that you think, as a government, if you are given an opportunity, that you too can boost and produce? Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, a few questions there, and um, okay. I, I will add a few more that okay. are kind of related, okay. so that maybe you can combine then, them from people at okay. home. Um, Alonso at Danjuma says, Mr. Shoei, what plans do you have with regards to our educational system? Okay. Having spent 20 years in the U.S., where there are foremost tertiary institutions, as against Nigeria, where our education has gotten so bad. Okay. Um, because you were asked about youth empowerment. Um, the youth, Mr. Nee Daniels, says the youth of our country have been neglected over time. A bill for an act to establish a youth-driven organization, Nigeria Peace Corps, was rejected by the president. Um, would you have dealt with this differently, or would you have done the same thing? So let's look at those um, okay. Okay, let me questions. start responding to some of the questions that somebody had already asked, and then also to give uh, something about the restructuring bit that you talked about. It is in our own interest, and of course the interest of wider Nigeria, that we look at economic restructuring, not the restructuring whereby political actors who won't have opportunity to really emasculate their people. You realize that there is a culture of perverse incentive in this country that even when the states are bailed out by the federal government, they ended up actually investing the money where it shouldn't be. Look at our markets in all the states, I think, almost all the states of the federal there had been fire incidences claiming actually millions and billions of people's but, but you, property. You're contesting for, for an office of president and vice president. Yeah. As far as I know, mm. your party doesn't have a lot of candidates contesting to be governor. Yes. And yet, you know, you seem to be talking to me about to the, the role of state governors. Yes. There's not much you can do about that, we, even we, if you are president and vice president. You, you can actually because leverage on their competitive advantage, actually, to provide them with incentive to grow and, and partner. Look at the state you come from, Zamfara. There is no local government in Zamfara state, 14 of them all, most without gold deposits. What is the state doing, actually, in order to, you know, bring out these resources? Some states have opportunity for tourism. So I'm like, trying to understand how at the center you can influence the way a state is governed because I'm still not clear you what, think you're, fair what enough. you're saying exactly. When the state actually runs to further Xmas every time they're in trouble and that you could not have some you know, policy networking with them even if you don't belong to the same party actually to work for the common man, that is what our interest is. Actually to see that the states on their own are more productive economically so that they can take care of their problems and their issues. And the quickest way to do that is to help them with strategic decision makings in the way they undertake their duty. What if they say no? Oh, come on. In this country, the poor will really vote them out of office. I agree. Because it disheartened me when you see serious investment that could be done and could improve the economic bit of these states that are not being taken. Those radical decisions have to be taken. And we have some candidates at our own, in our own party. And that's what we came up and that's what we are you know, interested in doing. Now let's begin to talk about some of the questions asked. The, the there issue is of one, actually, yeah. somebody mentioned that al majdi system, and I can tie it to the education sure. system. Uh, you realize that there, according to statistics, it depends on who you look, almost 13.5 million children, actually, that are out of school, and majority of them are even this al majdi system. And I thought this government uh, Professor, Professor, uh, uh, President Muhammad Buhari is from the north, Muslim, uh, would actually do something about it when he came to power. Mm. And he did nothing. He turned his back against them. And I understand that there's only one problem you can solve with no action, maybe alcoholic hangover. And I don't drink. So, okay, so definitely, what are you going to do? we will that's really that's take them off the street. We will really inject 200,000 teachers to teach in our primary school. The education at the primary Where, school level hang is... On, hang on, let me ask you a specific question. Where are you going to find those teachers? Teachers? We have seen, yes, 
Yep. We have seen that there's a death of skilled teachers. Teachers, yeah. Um, in the last few years, we've seen states mm -hmm. actually test yeah. even the ones that are in school mm -hmm. and find that they are not competent. Yep. And where they've actually tried to recruit, mm -hmm. some of them have had problems yes. getting people who are qualified. So if the you say money, to me, we, as soon as you enter office, you're mm -hmm. going to recruit 200,000 teachers, mm -hmm. the first question that comes to mind is where are you going to find them? You realize that we somehow, um, like, tech, when we see a problem, we take back steps and say, okay, see no evil here, no evil, talk no evil. Teacher education. These teachers can be put to good use when you incentivize and then you put a lot of resources actually to re-education of the teachers as they go on. So it wouldn't be an immediate there are thing, then you first have to re-educate them before the, you employ them. In our, in our recruitment process, selection and then their distribution, we really have to be keen on what quality they have. But there are a lot of Nigerians that are roaming our streets that are not employed and they have the certificate and the right uh, aptitude to teach in our primary schools. What? And the Quranic school education, you realize actually there are a lot of uh, ulama actually that are keen actually to see these children being reabsorbed into How a much formal money teaching. Will you put into education? Look, if Nigeria would go, which it's unlikely actually broke, one area that I'm sure everybody would be interested to put his last cobble is education and healthcare. Yeah, but I'm saying but when we did our research, yeah. Nigerians across all the regions we've been to. They're interested in having a good healthcare system and then education, education, education. When they met Shore on the road, Makaranta, Makaranta, that has always been this. this okay, thing. So, so again, and I, you know, I it's a public a good. I want a specific number. How mm. much money will you commit to putting into education if you are elected as president and vice president? Yeah. So, uh, sir, we have uh, done our work, our research, and it's going to be in two ways. The first is, of course, the normal budgetary process. And the next is, of course, the planning process over time. For instance, the 13 million kids that we have been talking about, and when you fact check these people, different figures pop up from different areas. We discover that with an average of 100,000 Naira investment over four years, you can take them, all of them out of school. As a matter of fact, the Universal Basic Education Act makes it a crime not to send children to school in this country. And most people don't know that a president of Nigeria could be impeached if they don't allow kids to go to school because it's a constitutional provision uh, of ours. What I'm saying here is that 1.3 trillion naira over four years, you know, taking kids out of school. Special intervention funds are there. We have an education tax that is line follow always. You have states that are supposed to match grants from UBEC funds that refuse to do this because they don't send their children to school here. He was mentioning President Buhari and so Amajiri. The reason Buhari it? doesn't care about Amajiri is because his children are not Amajiris. He doesn't so, send his children so, to school here. So far, Even though, yes. So what I'm saying here so is that... from a practical point of view, are you going to have a task force that's going to be on the streets taking children off the streets, putting them into school? No, what no. are you going to do? Look, when I was growing up under free education in Ondo states, there were task forces taking us out of school. I mean, out of street if you don't go to school. And they are in two ways. There are parents who are around looking for kids that don't go to school. They will drag you by your hair and send you back to school. That is how our African moral society operates. Of course, the war against the discipline once captured me on the street and took me back to school. But don't say that I'm endorsing Buhari's. <laughs> yes, no, I'm just telling you that you can actually have the police do the job of enforcing the UBEC Act. Okay. By make, when in the How US do you deal and in the UK where you live, if you don't send your children to school, the police is going to come after you. Okay, so there's it's a just a matter of ensuring that they get the mandate and they get the memo that it's a priority to let children go to school. And if they don't go to school, it becomes a law enforcement issue. There's a religious. There's a religious aspect mm -hmm. to the Almajiri yes. problem mm -hmm. because a lot of the parents whose kids end up on this street actually send out their kids to get what they consider an Islamic education. Yes. So what will you do about that particular aspect of the problem? You know, because the parents who feel they're sending their kids to get an Islamic education. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, 
I understand that, that very well. And I do not discountenance religious education. But what I'm saying is that there is a way we can innovatively also let these parents know that while their kids are learning in our primary schools, mm -hmm. they can also get it's Islamic in, education. Yes. It's the matter of bringing the teachers from Islamic education classes to come into the mainstream educational system. Look, well, you know, are you I, willing to do that? Oh, yes. absolutely. Yes. I, I studied Islamic education. It was one of my classes even in Nondo State. Mm. And Bible knowledge, mm. you know, and also if I, and all these things. We need to just let our curriculum be open-minded enough Okay, wait, to wait, the time is very little, so let's move to the all innovation. Yeah. And yeah. the guy who is an Islamic teacher on the same salary as the guy who is teaching science, they can match very well and be happy. What about the issue of power that was yeah. raised and the fact that power is actually on the exclusive list? And um, in discussing your plan, you didn't talk about how you're going to get around that problem. Uh, the, see, that's an, an interesting thing about Nigeria. So power is on the exclusive list, which means that the federal government has absolute control over power. But when it is time to sell assets in the power sector, it becomes a private issue. In fact, people tell you that business, government have no business in business. Mm. But when it is time to pay for to power companies, power that they supply, they give the invoice to the federal government. I am interested in ensuring that there's power. Whether it is exclusive or inclusive, whichever list it can belong to, as long as the as as the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, mm. I can light up this country. Mm. It will be a legislative agenda that I will discuss with legislators at the National Assembly that look, the most important thing is not the language in which we couch where power belongs, mm. but how our people can get electricity. Mm. That is what is most important to me. Mm. You know, but what I'm saying here, mm. and I, I, let me land, mm. what I'm saying here mm. is that this idea that we are deregulating mm -hmm. and privatizing a sector that suddenly is also still in the exclusive list, and the federal government is not supposed to say anything about it, is the oxymoron of the power sector. Mm -hmm. It's not oxymoron in my view, it's abracadabra. Mm -hmm. They don't want there to be light in this country. We have paid for it. Where did the 16 billion naira that the PDP spent on power come from? The federal government. Yep. But Nobody is holding the private sector responsible for darkness. It's the federal government that is responsible for the lack of electricity in this country. The federal government better guide its loans, recover what it needs to recover. What our people need is light, not excuses and where it belongs. And, and, it, it, sounds, it, and it sounds great. You know. but, but you know, um, it, hang on. Well, it sounds great and populist, and you'll get your applause. Mm -hmm. But when you're in government, they're practical. This is, let, let me finish. This is what they always me, tell us. I'm yeah. going to ask the question. Mm -hmm. There are practical issues, there are rules, there are policies that guide these things. And to be able to change those rules, you must either go to the National Assembly or find a way to get people across. And so her question is still valid mm -hmm. because. The federal government remains in charge. And so when you talk about deploying farm, mm. uh, solar panels, and all of that, mm. there are real practical things to be dealt with in terms of who is allowed to do what. That and that is really her question. How are you going to get around that particular fact? But that's what I'm saying. It is still the duty of the federal government. The federal government is still the authority in charge of granting the power for people to generate electricity. It is still the federal government. It is still the federal government that is in control of the TCA, what they call the Transmission Company of Nigeria. Mm. So the federal government has not lost the power to power up Nigeria mm. to the extent that I should be sweating about the legislative concerns mm. about that. We have enough power as a federal government to light up this country. We've looked at the laws, we've looked at the rules, but the rules that nobody wants to talk about is the people who are sabotaging our ability to generate electricity. And as a result, we can't industrialize. Our children can't go to bed to do their, uh, their homework because there's no light. We cannot have an economy that is built around darkness. That is the truth. She said it. 
that in this country, the cost of production is the highest because we don't have electricity. Let me ask you a question. Yes. What are your thoughts on the current complaints about low tariffs from the supply side? Um, will you address steady power supply first or will you increase tariffs first? No. Because, you know, there's that issue of what comes first. Is it the chicken mm. or the egg? Mm. Because the current distribution companies mm -hmm. argue that they are so regulated that they cannot charge what is uh, a commercial rate for power. Mm. And that basically stops them from being able to invest and be able to do what they need to do. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. <laughs> so the interesting thing is that it's a very simple issue. There's a consumer who is the demand side and there's a supply side. Do you know what is driving tariffs up? is because they want to collect more than they are supplying. Mm -hmm. Just come and give people prepaid meters. Mm -hmm. An average household in Nigeria consumes about 6,000 Naira electricity per month. But the power companies, being the greedy people they are, want to collect 20,000 Naira from you. If they take their 16,000, I mean 6,000 Naira per household mm -hmm. or per meter, they still make a profit. They so make let, let me ask huge you a enough specific profit, question. But you cannot continue, let me say this, you cannot satisfy the greed of people who are not interested in getting satisfied. Mm -hmm. And that's where government comes in. Mm -hmm. It is not a matter of regulation. Go ask the, you know, the power ministry now. The minister of power is looking for a third party to supply meters, mm -hmm. prepaid meters to consumers. Because they can't get these greedy power suppliers to make it available, even when they are available. Why, do you know what will happen? At the end of the day, the cost of those third party involvement will still be transferred so, to the consumer. Whereas, so, if you so, don't have special interests who sponsor you to office, mm. who are your godfathers, you just have to be government. You take a stand and you say, sir, every prepared meter out there must be given to consumer. And if you are not, there are people, plenty of people, yeah, who are willing, and I mean it, willing to generate power, we need to supply power for 6,000 naira per household, make enough profit let, for let, me, let me, and then me, everybody will be happy. Let, let but ask, it makes, you, you're making it sound like these things are difficult. But no, I'm looking I at it from the point of view of what is easy to do. I am, I am trying to understand the practicalities of what happens if you are elected and tomorrow mm. your president of Nigeria. Because it's you not going to be tomorrow, have... it's going to be February 16th. <laughs> <laughs> And um, your president and there are these distribution companies, they're already in place. Yeah. They've bought all these assets. Mm -hmm. They're responsible for distributing power within certain areas. Your location. Your location has their location. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm trying to understand from a practical point of view, you, you get into office, what exactly is going to happen? And if, I'm not sure I'm clear. No, I'm, I'm very clear that the day I get into office. What will be your relationship, for example, with the, with the distribution companies? Are is, you, will you be seeking to take away their, their distribution licenses? Any, what will if, you do? If some of them are not even carrying out what they have been licensed to do, we cannot continue to pamper those ones. We take back their licenses. If you are not distributing, you don't, you don't sit down on a license and refuse to carry out the service for which the license is met. That is where the regulation was supposed to have. That was why I discussed the regulation earlier. If these license owners had been the ones who are generating their electricity, they would have been eager to distribute it. But because it doesn't belong to them, and they got it they at They buy it. Huh? They buy it. They bank? They buy it from the generation They didn't, they didn't buy anything. These guys, were, they dashed it to them. Some of them are going to jail now. No, it's true. You know, some of them have been arrested for how they duped banks mm. to buy these things. We gave them subventions. This country gave them trillions, I mean, almost a trillion naira subventions after we gave them the power sector generating companies at under the table, I mean, under market value prices. I mean, I have been involved in investigating these things. I'm just telling you that probably that's the reason why they will sit up. I'm not going to do any body language governance. Mm -hmm. so I'll be there so you're asking going to go questions. So you in there and basically yeah. disrupt everything. That's it, what I'm hearing. Is, why won't you disrupt criminality? That's the job of the executive <laughs> section. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
If you go to president, if there are criminals taking advantage of your people, do you just sit down there and say, because? Final question before yes. we go on break. Yes. Part of the problems that Nigeria has, particularly with investors, oh. is that people believe Governments don't respect agreements. Mm. You have one government come, do a concession, give a license, agree a contract. Another government comes and disrupts it. Yeah. And this has um, a serious implication for confidence. Mm. So those investors that uh, you keep wanting to attract, the PPP that you're talking about, get a little bit wary of this country because they think people come and they change things. It sounds like what you want to do. No. Do you know why those kind of PPPs are difficult to deal with? Because when they have a president that is called Fortunato, con collecting bribes, mm -hmm. you lose your integrity before partners. Mm -hmm. But this is the most important thing you must understand. There are international agreements governing investment in every country. We have discussed MTN taking out $13 billion. If Sahara Reporter hadn't exposed it, the federal government would not have asked them to bring back the money. And when they did, what did they do? They went back to the door. We are only getting 80 something million naira back from 13 billion naira that they took away illegally through the Central Bank of Nigeria. That is criminality. You know? and, and that is what we are going to disrupt. But you knew, and you knew, that what did they do? They went to judges to be looking for injunctions. Whereas they are supposed to just respect an agreement not to take money illegally okay. out of we, this we, country. We have, you do it in the we US, have to be careful you are going to not jail. Not to libel people. Yeah. I know you are used to be sued. Yeah, but no, can they, can can they can sue me. They can sue me. I'm a presidential really candidate. Careful. You can sue me I am before going the to election. Because after the election, I will have immunity. I'm going to take a very quick break. Stay with us. I'm going to take a very quick break. I'm going to take a very quick break. Oh, today I've been in pain.
Welcome back. You are watching The Candidates, brought to you by Darien Media and the Nigerian Television Authority, with the support of the MacArthur Foundation. Now, before the break, we'd started taking some audience questions, and there were a few that we'd not um, yeah. dealt with, and if we could quickly before we yeah. enter the next segment. So there was a question around what your plans are for young people, yes. um, and then uh, your plan for uh, human capacity. And finally, there was a question around our culture, I think, and our sort of mindsets. Mm -hmm. So maybe if we could deal with those really quickly before we move into yes. talking about security and a few other things. Well, with regards to young people, there are two very important things we must do for young people in this country. is to invest in their education, mm -hmm. and then after they get out of school, to find them jobs. And our party, our uh, mandate will provide over 5 million jobs, and we're very specific about that that in the past sector alone, we're looking about to providing almost two million mm. uh, jobs, you know, especially as we invest in a mixed bag of, you know, sources of providing power, electricity in the country. In the security sector, where we need a massive infusion of uh, personnel, we're looking into providing almost 200 to 300,000 jobs, you know, getting more recruitment into the police, the army, mm -hmm. Uh, and other security agencies that we need to keep us secure as a country. Uh, we are also going to invest in education in such a way that we'll revive every available scholarship that is out there for young people, for students. Uh, we have looked at the number of students in this country and we think and believe that we can afford to even give study allowances to students. And I know you are going to jump at me as to where I'll find it. You know, let me, let me, let me say, let me finish, let me finish. And, you know, I have been in a country where I wasn't even a citizen, the U.S. And before I, be, sorry, before I even got my paperwork normalized at Columbia University, I already had student loans. I had what they call Pell Grants provided for me as a student, the to the extent that I could pay the, the my American, rent, the American and I am not, so I'm just is saying that, huge. It is, it they is don't huge. rely on but one do you, source do of you, income do you like know, we do. do you know that The America, price of well is not, you know, crashing, all we of have that, always, so. We have always used, we're sitting down here giving excuses on behalf of people I'm who are failed. I'm not giving failed. excuses, I'm trying to get you mm -hmm. to I am trying to, to tell the Nigerian people that How with the judicious use of their resources, what you want to do. Yes. This is I'm the telling question. Nigerians that with the judicious use of their resources, we can support our country, we can support our young people, we can support our children, we can support our elders, we can support everybody. There is enough to go around. But when you continue to feed the greedy, the needy will always suffer. You cannot satisfy the greedy minority in this country. And okay, so let me you ask are, you a specific let me, let question me, about that I want, I want to jump in no, no, with one more no, no, thing. No, quick question, quick mm. question. Yes. Mm. The National Assembly. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the institutions mm -hmm. that Nigerians generally, when you talk to, believe are overpaid yes. mm. and utilize a percentage of our resources that is way over what it is. What are you going to do about that? Exactly where I was coming to. You know, and this exactly answers the question of people who are earning minimum wage and people who are earning maximum wage. The National Assembly, a senator in Nigeria is earning 14 million naira. This is not, I didn't make it up. Mm -hmm. If you are earning 30,000 naira, the, their own minimum wage, or the 28,000 naira, 27,000 naira they approved at the Council of State yesterday, mm -hmm. it will take you 38 years to make the salary of a senator in Nigeria in a month. A monthly salary of a senator. It takes a Nigerian worker earning 30,000, 38 years to make it. It takes a professor who is earning 450,000 naira per month, almost 10 years to make the monthly salary of a senator. But here, you don't like it when I say that there's money for the poor. No, I want to you know, know what you, you want to me to explain. It. We're saying our problem is not wet generation in Nigeria, it's wet distribution. Wow. That's our problem. So, we are circulating our words you, in the, in so the you, hands of just a minority. Okay, so there are two issues you've yes. raised here, and yes. I'd like you to quickly deal with yeah. them. Again, time is a factor. Um, the first is really trying to understand how, as president, you will get the National Assembly to review 
It's um, not about... What? No, no, because at the end of the day, they make the laws, yes. right? So the, and the second issue is that you, you, you talked about this. Are you saying you are satisfied with our productivity level in this country? Because you keep saying our problem is not wealth generation, it is wealth distribution. Well, well, um, so are you happy with our no. productivity? The productivity will happen when we invest in our people. Mm. When we invest in education, when we invest in power, you know, we have a port, a national port that can expand, mm -hmm. but it also has become a basket case. Mm -hmm. So you are there pouring water into it, the National Assembly is taking its own, the subsidy people are taking their own. Mm -hmm. Until you plug that, you have a whole port, and the port can expand because now there's power, there's productivity, mm -hmm. you have students who are going to school, and you can then be looking into a future of a knowledge economy, where mm -hmm. information, because that's what I want to get to. Mm -hmm. Somebody asked me here before, you know, what other products can you do after rice? No, I'm not after cocoa or gold. I'm after the knowledge of Nigerians that we can sell into the future. You know, because if you look at even the stock markets of major countries in the world, it is not cocoa and rubber that they are selling. They are, you know, Amazon is there, you know, uh, Microsoft is there, Apple is there. If you invest in our universities, FUTA, can produce one student, that is the Federal University of Technology in Akure, <laughs> or the one in Mina, can produce one student that can innovate to the extent that we can have a Facebook founder in this country yeah. that, will be, that will be ruling How the world. How will you and, persuade and, the National Assembly to yeah. cut down so on the... So the National that. Assembly, going to their own case, there is no way we can accept an illegality. The allowances they are paying themselves, according to even the laws of the law, are illegal. They are not entitled to more than one million naira or thereabouts in allowances. So the mere fact that somebody has taken over the lunatic asylum mm. and is awarding himself, mm. I mean themselves what they like, doesn't mean that it is legal. We can challenge it. Yep. We have a court in this land which we can challenge and see how much are they entitled to, how much should they be collecting. If we cannot get them to drop it, the country might as well drop them. Okay. That's the truth. <laughs> Now, let me quickly, because the time is limited, Dr. Rufai, um, security. Okay. Nigeria is facing multiple challenges on the area of security. Uh -huh. uh, we're fighting an insurgency in the northeast, uh -huh. Boko Haram. We have bandits and rustlers in the northwest. Uh -huh. uh, we have a little bit of uh, issues with farmers and herders in the central part of, north central part of Nigeria. Uh -huh. There's still a bit of restiveness in the East mm -hmm. with um, organizations like IPOP talking about, uh, mm -hmm. you know, breaking away and forming Biafra. Mm -hmm. What are your plans for securing Nigeria? Oh. Well, you actually highlighted the fact that we are dealing with hybrids of criminal elements here and there from Boko Haram in the Northeast and then down to the Niger Delta and the agitation of the IPOPs and co. Uh, you realize that they have something in common, all of them, meaning there's some sort of complacency at the center where the generals, the police, uh, at the helm of our security have not been actually doing very well to what they are assigned to do. And then if you now unpack other security challenges like the hardest and the farmers clash has its own uniqueness in, in some ways. So you really have to break down what sort of security challenge is and then to actually develop an innovative solution towards it. But the first is actually to know that Nigeria will do better, we will live in peace and progress when we don't condone anybody's crime because he belongs to a certain tribe, creed, religion or anything. We really have to have a way of bringing people accountable to their crimes, whoever they are. If you take the farmers' hardest clash, well, we only have to reflect on what is happening in the Sahel. They have always found themselves in the middle of the desert. They don't have water, bodies, and so on. But they still produce their economically prosperous to some extent. No killing like the scale we have in Nigeria. So you realize in Nigeria, for us to solve the problems of hardest and cattle, we need to actually change the way we do agriculture. We need to adapt to the climate change and the issues around it. And then, of course, last time, I'm sure you saw the video if you did your homework well. The, the Fulani issue we made in Taraba and Jalungu were asking Shore, when are we going to have schools for our kids? When are we going to have better 
uh, you know, system to take care of our cattle were tired of being killed and so on. Then he said, well, it's the commercial ranching, which has the potential actually for these herders to actually access animal sciences product, meaning the way they could propagate faster and better, they can graze, and then, of course, to get veterinary care from the government at some people, and then some PPP with interested people, actually, we can actually have commercial ranching. These are likely to fatten their cows to produce more, create a value chain along that that can feed us with milk and there you have more prosperity. Agree, we don't have dams, infrastructure are very but few. I, I am so sorry to keep doing this to you, but that is exactly what this government is proposing. What? Ranching. Oh, the, the, government is, the, the government but is proposing... have they tackled the adaptation of the climate change? They didn't mention so it the clearly. I'm just, I'm just pointing out. The government is proposing grazing corridors and cattle colonies. colonies. And they are ranching. different from commercial mm. ranches. And ranching. No, I'm not aware. I mean, mm. no, look, you had a hectic time interviewing the president and yeah, the DPA last time. So maybe <laughs> there's a problem of understanding of what it meant, you know. We, we went through that, yeah. So what they are saying is mm. that they want grazing corridors, mm. they want cattle colonies. Mm. We are proposing commercial ranching, mm. in which case somebody can own a ranch. There are 20 million cows oh. roaming around in Nigeria. Mm. And you find out that because they are even roaming around in ways that are not productive, they hardly can produce milk, and most of them are suffering malnutrition. Mm. If you keep them in a ranch, they will be fat cows. Mm -hmm. You know, and anybody can go into the business because the cow meat business is a three billion dollar industry. Mm. Yeah. You know, that we have not tapped into. But beyond that, there are droppings. Mm -hmm. The cow dung can also be used for biogas, from which we can generate over mm. one thousand megawatts of electricity. So this is what innovative leadership is about, not these analog leaders who are talking about the past. You ask the president here last week, with due respect, <laughs> about how to solve the... He never mentioned commercial ranch. I watched him. The, the uh -huh. VP did. Yeah, oh, no, the that's why I'm saying president, what the VP, VP knows about Nigeria and what the president knows. They are two different... You know, me and him... <laughs> the, yes, it's true. <laughs> Going by what we saw here last week, there is a miscommunication between the VP and the president. <laughs> so it's a bifurcated presidency, <laughs> but our own will be one. Okay. Yes. Go, go for her. Boko, Boko Haram. Yeah? Boko Haram. Yes. Yeah. What is your solution? Solution to Boko Haram is direct. Every 10 years, any local insurgency of any kind must be defeated by country. They usually last next gestation period of insurgencies of that nature. But the problem with Boko Haram was that the moment it transmuted from being a crisis to a business, there was no way it was going to end. As a reporter, I was the first person who was reporting that army generals were not buying equipment, they were not paying their soldiers who were in the front lines, and I was derided for it, that it was because I didn't want the other party to win. Eventually, how many of the generals were arrested, prosecuted in the army, in the navy, in the air force? But you know what? When they got to the army, the record of the prosecution disappeared. Okay, so when you the people become president, who are in this will you, will you so, arrest and prosecute army generals? Absolutely. You know, I have said not only will I do that, any army general that has been involved in fighting the Boko Haram insurgency will be asked to leave peacefully the armed forces. Because that is not a general that can win a war. But when you keep them around, the president said it, I think it's on Arise TV, that he realized that some of the army commanders have overstayed their usefulness. But it today, so we'll he has purge. not fired them. He has not relieved them of under, their responsibility. Under a Shawori president, yes. we'll see a purge of the army, oh, taking I'm, out the we, we, top it, people. That is something that you do from time to time. It's natural with people who are, you know, sometimes even without corruption, fatigue sets in. Mm. What we have found out in the armed forces, instead of allowing the younger, well-trained officers to take over command positions, the older ones, the corrupt, you know, Big fat ones don't leave, even though they don't leave Abuja, but they have refused to allow promotion of people who have been trained because they don't want them to become progress, they don't want them to make progress within the armed forces. And these are the guys that are willing to wipe out these guys. 
But the ones that are making money off of it, they don't want the Boko Haram insurgency to end. OK, That's I would it. take two mm -hmm. quick questions on security, just to wrap up this section. Um, OK, so the gentleman here in the black suit with the blue shirt, please, sir, go to the mic. And then the gentleman right at the back. Yes, sir, just, yeah. just come. Because we've literally got five minutes. You need to be quick. Yes, good evening, Mr. Shaware. Because of time, um, I want you to tell Nigerians uh, how differently will you want to fight corruption because that has not been tackled on this podium. Okay. That is a remainder. Then two. No, 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 no. Housing. Sir, no, sir, no. So please, housing. could you have respect okay. for people, please? Thank you very much. Uh, there's five minutes to go, sir. So how, how would you tackle? My name, my name is Caleb Terinyikwa. I'm the gubernatorial candidate on the platform of African Action Congress in Benue State. And over and over, this question gets thrown to me, the issue of um, hazemen and farmers' clashes. Yes. And the VP answered a part of it. But the issue is that even in commercial um, ranching, you need the people to give the land. Mm -hmm. The problem down there is that people are not ready to give the land. Because there is now a tussle, an emotional and cultural clash between these two people, forcing them to give out the land for commercial. They, they perceive it as you are trying to force them to be defeated in the war. Okay. So it's an emotional so, so, yeah, issue. So how, how do you do tackle that? that? Thank you. Okay. And, and I'm going to add a final question. Yeah. And if we could end on that, then we'll go. Um, you were quoted as uh, saying at an event that um, you want to legalize marijuana and make it a commodity that can generate money. I'd like to understand what you said, whether you were quoted correctly, whether it's a question of legalizing it for use domestically as well, or whether it's going to be legalized just as a business for export. Okay. And it, um, you've got literally a minute. I'll answer that first, because I know it's very important. Uh, we are legalizing it for export. It's, there's a huge market out there. Uh, for cannabis. Uh, the one that we grow in Nigeria is called Cannabis Sativa. Mm. It has a lot of medicinal use. And the only part of marijuana that people worry about is the part that has a THC, you know. Mm. And there's a marijuana that can be grown that we not even contain that. Marijuana or the hemp tree can also be used in place of cotton. So you're not looking to allow Nigerian use to Look. be smoking anyhow? <laughs> The already, anybody that wants marijuana in Nigeria can get it. I don't have to worry about them. And I'm telling you, it's available anywhere you turn in this country. Marijuana has always been available. People deceive themselves. What I'm saying is that we have NDLA burning 1.5 trillion naira worth of marijuana every year. Canada is in need of it. Let's pack it and send it to them. You know, the U.S. is in need of them. And we can make, and that can help us diversify our economy, by the way. The people of Ondo State can get $4 billion from marijuana in a year, a do state, and that triangle, the marijuana triangle, worried, Delta, are you, are you worried at all that because you end up with a business in weed, yes. you may end up with um, a situation where, in many ways, you are enabling um, a bigger population to use marijuana. Is no, that a concern no, at all? No, no. It's not, it's not a concern because the medicinal value of marijuana, if but, you... Do you it, smoke? No, no, I've never smoked marijuana before. Yeah, but, never. But let me let me. Let you you keep talking I've about it. In fact, I've never quality. smoked have, before. I've never smoked before. I, I have to come in I've here, so, actually. We're aware of the use of illicit drugs in this country, and it's a big epidemic over the last couple of years. But the government of President Muhammad Buhari didn't do much in that direction because a report came in 2014 that there was never a time in history when these illicit drugs became cheaper, more available, and in their purest form than that. But the government did nothing in terms of prevention, actually, or enforcing, actually, children and other measures. Then a video came up from BBC as a documentary. You really and have that, very little time. And that, so. actually, made Nigerian government to have a knee-jerk reaction. They banned the importation of codeine, I yeah. guess, and that created a balloon effect. Okay. Now people are sniffing gutters, are doing <laughs> others. So the best is actually to tackle the problem okay. head on from different angles. That okay, the corruption have. question for yes, corruption is really important. Adds, what are you going yes. to do different We're tackling from what's corruption happening with the use, And we don't have time. With the use of preventive measures, we talk about even paying people living wage so that they don't start thinking about stealing for the future. Mm. You know, there's need for enforcement, but most importantly, because corruption is carried out by the highest 
people in this country are the ones who are the most corrupt. There has to be consequences, you know, for people to know that it is not all right to be corrupt and get a shift and sit title or sit in front of the you judge. You need and the get judiciary. We need well, there are issues that we yes. have heard so are going the on. enforcement so. will help us even in the judiciary. Look, Nigeria has been playing around with corruption for a long time, but you know as an individual, mm -hmm. I have been fighting corruption for the last 12 years on Sahara Reporters alone. The Chief Justice of Nigeria that is under trial, and I was the first person on Sahara Reporters who put out his account saying that he has money that he can't explain. Do you know what happened when so, I did so it? The EFCC issued a statement that I was lying. Now, when it is politically expedient, mm -hmm. It's undergoing trial. Okay. So <laughs> you know what it is. So headsman clash, I wanted to say about land. Yeah. There is enough land in Nigeria that you don't have to force anybody to give you land to do commercial ranching. What, why we call it commercial ranching is that if you give up your land, you are protected by law so that nobody takes it from you. you know? Listen, the redeemed church, every year, they slaughter over 20,000 cows when they have the Holy Ghost mm -hmm. uh, thing that they do, Congress that they do. Mm -hmm. They can have their own ranch. You know, I make fun of the people in the Southwest. If they kill a cow in the Southwest, only the blood will be left. They eat every part of it. Mm -hmm. But there's no ranch. But when Awulawa was around, he created a ranch in Akuno. The Calabar Ranch that is there today that is being used for tourism. Uh, for tourism used to be a cattle ranch. Okay, so, so it's nothing new. A, We've had a final question on yes. that before we go away. Are you at all concerned about the people whose way of life you would be disrupting, who are also Nigerian citizens? So the Fulanis that are used to grazing. Yeah. What are, I, 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 are you? What are the, the plans for them? No, because, you know, once you sort of take away that, that it's a, it's a way of life. We're not, we're not taking away their way of life. Okay. I am doing this based on my conversation with a Fulani man or a number of Fulani people yeah. who have said that they will be comfortable okay. raising their cows in a ranch. Yeah. And the reason why the Fulani man is walking around with 400 cows and his children and his wife is because he wants to make money, yeah. not because he wants to be lean. If they want to be lean, they can go to do marathons for us <laughs> at the Olympics. But it's about money and it's about innovation. A Fulani man can be in a ranch and still be walking around in the ranch on the back of a horse. And you would love to see him. He will even become a touristic center where okay. you can yeah. go and see the new Fulani man and his ranch and, you, and, you, his, and his cattle. You are mm -hmm. aware that in the Mambila Plateau, mm -hmm. for yeah. example, yeah. ranches exist. Yeah. And yet, these issues that we've had mm -hmm. are still ongoing. You've got clashes between Fulani ranch owners and Mambila farmers, yes. leading to hundreds of deaths. And these clashes happen, they die down, they happen historically. Yeah. Um, suggesting that perhaps the problem isn't that of people not being in ranches. What are your thoughts on this? No, no. So how many ranches do we have? And we have already discussed the issue of climate change. Yeah. You have a huge expanse of land also in what used to be Sambisa Forest and beyond and the Lake Chad region Almost that has been taken over by terrorists that you are not taking back from them. Our own position is that there will be a holistic solution that, you know, we drive Boko Haram out of the place, it frees yeah. up the land, mm -hmm. almost the size of the state of Virginia in the U.S. Yeah. The people who want to go back to Sambisa Forest, for example, may not need ranch because the place is available for free mm -hmm. for you to graze. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying that you can duplicate ranches that is not only in the Mambila area. And you know the reason why the issue of Mambila is different is that people are looking at it from who is superior to who. And this is where you start to talk about the security agencies at the top and how people view them you, when they intervene, when there's a clash. When you sadly, see a minister of defense acting sadly, as if he's on the side of one side against the other, sadly, you have a problem. Sadly, mm. we've run out of time. Thank you. And I have to leave it here. Thank you so much, Mr. Shere. Thank you. And Mr. Hopefully we'll be there on our inauguration. Yes, and, and, and I'll be reminded there's a final important question and I need a short, short answer. Mm -hmm. If you lose, oh. will you accept the results of the elections? If the elections are free and fair, there's no way we can lose. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you again. Thank you very much. The next edition of the candidates will take place, God willing, in exactly seven days from 8 to 10 p.m. It will be a live show once more, and we'll be talking to the presidential and vice presidential candidates of the People's Democratic Party, the PDP. That's Nigeria's former vice president, Agaji Atiku Abubakar, and the former governor of Anambra State, Mr. Peter Obi. Until then, we wish you a very good evening.